Hi, my name is Todd Fry. I worked at Atari. I wrote, as likely many of you know. <laughs> I wrote this. <laughs> Pac-Man for the Atari 2600. Largely that's why I'm here. Okay, so let's get a couple of things out of the way. <laughs> I'm actually a little anxious. I'll probably get over that in a little while, and I might not, but you know, we'll see what happens. Um, so, Pac Man. <laughs> I was joking with Howard the other day that since um, the, the power duo of Howard Scott Warshaw and Todd Fry can collapse multi billion dollar industries, <laughs> <laughs> we should certainly do industry kill for hire. And I'm really not sure whether we should work for the Republican National Convention or for the coal industry. <laughs> I mean, pick an industry, and we could make a lot of money destroying multi-billion dollar industries. <laughs> We've been actually had time to get better at this, so we might be able to take down like a trillion dollar industry. It's like really fun. We could go work for Facebook, and it would like disappear. <laughs> so. Uh, um, Pac-Man was like a critical flop. It's really interesting, actually, to have been. Um, so I'll do some setup, share some of my thoughts, ask some questions. I got a little bit of code I want to share. Um, how are y'all doing? Great, good. So far, so good. Keep going. <laughs> Just be patient. <laughs> okay. Um, so I worked really hard on Pac-Man. And um, I was actually pretty proud of it. And there's a lot of backstory. And if you ask the right questions, I will tell the truth. Um, <laughs> as best as I can recollect. Um, which I can actually probably remember a lot. Um, and it was actually really interesting, because I get to think about this. I still care. Oh, you would too if you were me. Um, Atari was a really intense way. I call it, you know, childhood. My 20s. I'm like in my 60s now, so I can call my 20s my youth. Um, it was a really intense and really incredibly powerful way to spend part of my time on this planet. Uh, there were actually historically significant things happening in the world, and in Silicon Valley, and in Atari, and in the whole thing that it was to be the creation of the video games industry. Um, I have some adequately deranged thoughts about it, which I will not share today. Um, one of the things that's interesting is that, I mean, I've come to realize that actually the whole industry of even, um, of even video game criticism was brand new. A video game production was brand new. I mean, I got a pretty nice screenshot of the guy who took this game and just changes the color from blue to black and the color from orange to blue. And wow, it looks a lot better. Um, okay, I'm not very well organized. I do have a thing that I did because one of the things that people hated about Pac-Man was the flicker on the ghosts. And the um, truth is that I had put together, I invested several weeks in a display where I could reposition the ghosts at any of the maze horizontal lines. And if they weren't in the same row, I could, I could put four or five, I could put five objects on the screen if they weren't in the same row. And I was working on the amazingly difficult code of, um, how to get them to decide how much flicker they needed, right? It's flicker managers. Uh, people have done this later um, for a variety of ways. Uh, but I ran out of time. So I just went, OK, great. Can't do it. I threw all that code away. I super simplified, and I super simplified. Um, one of the things that I like to do is show a little bit of Atari code. Um, and so I wrote a new Flickr manager for Pac-Man this weekend. This week, actually. 
because I can't get rid of the flicker. But what I can do is something like this. So this is like this amazing product. I don't even know this website. It's like uh, 8bitworkshop.com. It's got like a tar It's got a 6502 IDE along the far side. And a 2600 emulator along this side. It's all written in JavaScript. I mean, this stuff is fucking impossible. <laughs> <laughs> and here it is. So this is actually just a demo. I didn't do the vertigo. I'm not moving everything around to make No, I am not rewriting Pac-Man in my spare time. It's a lot of work to do something like Pac-Man in 4K. This is the Pac-Man. Uh, okay. This here, Pac-Man. Looks about the same here as it does in the actual shipping product. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't quite see it in this display, so this is funky. I'll hold up my laptop. Those with good eyesight can see that there are four ghosts. For some reason don't show up on this screen here, but there are four ghosts. Each one on the screen for one out of four frames. You all see that? Oh well, battle plan, contact, enemy, all that. Um, so I don't know what's happening with the display. It's like, actually, like I said, this is impossible. So, oh well. Um, so what I did is I thought about it and I decided that um, actually, I don't see any reason to make the pack. The easiest thing to do is to actually just go to a different multiplex manager and do this, actually. And it looks just like this. Except it won't look like right up there, so I'll have to show you my little Chromebook again. Oh, that. Wow, that looks awful. Um, so there's something really interesting. LCDs are not like CRTs at all. LCDs are not like CRTs at all. It's like they are so much crisper, and they're, they don't have the persistence that the phosphors did. So Flickr looks insanely worse on LCDs than it actually did in 1982 on CRTs. What this is, is each four objects treated with the same, each five objects treated with the same priority. So that each one is on the screen for two out of five frames. It's a 40% flicker. The other Pac-Man was 100% for the player, 25% for the ghosts. This is the much more equitable. 40% for every object. I don't know that I can do that much better than this. Um, and then I'm going to take you through a little bit of the coding process for just a moment. But let's stop just a moment. So are there any questions yet? We got any questions, comments, criticisms? I'm very used to criticism. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in a Yes, sir. I have a comment. Uh, I do think you're probably a little harder Yeah, but it wouldn't be great if I could destroy billion dollar industries. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, so, I've been wanting to ask this since I was a kid. Um, it would have been so simple. You even say it. Black background, blue walls. Why didn't you do that if your job is to translate the arcade game? I mean, you know, flickering ghosts and maze design. I mean, it still essentially plays like Pac-Man. But, oh my god, it was, gave me a headache even as a kid to play the game. Well. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a couple of things about that. I realized last year, literally on the same stage, that, um, um, everything was being done for the first time, really. I mean, actually, um, not everything was being done for the first time, but a lot of things were being done for the first time. Um, like, like E.T. was the first, like, major anticipated movie translation. It was fucking great. And nothing like that had ever been done before in history, really, honestly. And um, the thing about Pac-Man, was it was, was it, the video games industry was so young that people didn't know exactly what was important about a game. I mean, you could look at Pac-Man and you know the ghosts and the dots and the little Pac-Man, all important, but really, 
From where I sat, no one knew that the exact color of the background in the maze was what it meant to be Pac-Man or how big a part of Pac-Man it was. And in addition to that, you're right, it is hard to believe. It is actually hard to understand. It is hard to understand how ignorant we were in 1981 because 1981 is already, like as a carpenter, I used to say it looks great in the glow of my tail lights as I'm driving away, you know, that nice red glow that the building's in. Um, it is so long ago, it is actually really incredibly hard to comprehend how ignorant we were. I mean, there is no way. The other factor, which actually tipped the scales, is that because we were on CRTs, there was phosphor burning. Right, that's why we have a track mode. That's why if I go back to my Pac-Man now, which is happily playing along in a track mode, changing its colors automatically every now and then while you're not playing, which is largely so that in the stores we won't destroy the display TVs. There was a guideline at Atari that you should not use black backgrounds unless you were doing a space game. So like the good, obedient worker that I was. Howard can attest to how obedient and compliant I was in every respect. <laughs> I went, okay, if you can't use black backgrounds, you can't use black backgrounds, oh wow. It's like, um, and so that's like kind of this double whammy, and I was a little oblivious. And um, yes, I do have regrets. Um, so back, any other? Yes, sir. Um, you talked about all the issues you had, but it seems like the easy solution was to make the Pac-Man not eat out of his head or his chin, you know, feeding four up or down. Huh? His mouth only moves left and right. In the original Pac-Man, it eats upward, it eats down. Oh, actually, that would have been a lot of wrong. I mean, I know that people have looked at it as like, boy, hindsight. I actually would have to look at it. Um, interesting thing is, is that I didn't actually do the artwork. I just took the artwork that was handed to me. And this is another really weird thing, okay. Now, Howard tells me it is a waste of time to defend a Pac-Man. <laughs> and actually, um, I guess I have some spare time. <laughs> uh, I don't, that would have actually been um, what could be, at the time, felt like a non-trivial amount of RAM. Also, we were just making this transition where we had artists making the artwork. It was really actually quite strange to be in that position, where before that we'd draw it out in graph paper and do the... Literally, we didn't even have art to us. Right? You take a piece of graph paper, you draw out your freaking artwork, and you translate it to hexadecimal by hand in the lines right next to it, and then you type it into your assembler. This was stone knives and bear claws. Um, but in this case, I had an artist just delivering the artwork they said that they thought would work for Batman. Um, so there's that. Yeah, it's, it's not my fault. Um, and there's also the RAM. And there's also the fact that we just didn't know what mattered. We just didn't know. If someone had said, this is really important, we probably wouldn't have believed them. Um, and then I would have gone, that sounds to me like another 16 bytes of RAM. That sounds to me like another 16 bytes of RAM. Are you kidding me? I mean, 4K, you know, so that's that. Way in back there. Hey, um, so I know that, um, that there was at least one um, adaptation of an arcade game that I can think of in Space Invaders, of course, which, you know, is still, I think, in a lot of people. Yep. Love. I, I still play it once in a while on the Stella emulator. And um, so I, I'm just curious, did you have, I'm not sure who, who coded Space Invaders. Richard Marrow. Oh, okay. So, did you have any um, <coughs> did, did you have any conversations with him about what made his version? Because it came, I'm assuming, that had to have come before. Oh, I'll tell you a couple of things. Uh, except I won't, because I would be indiscreet. Um, <laughs> I actually think Richard wasn't around that much. Richard was, um... I later on reverse engineered you know, read the assemblies and understood how, how Space Invaders worked, but honestly, Richard wasn't around very much then. And it wasn't really like that. Also, Pac-Man is nothing like Space Invaders. If you look at the internals, there's the only thing, um, I think the vertical synchronization and possibly the score kernel are remotely similar. They're incredibly disjoint. Just in terms of adapting a pre-existing arcade game, that's what I think. 
Did everyone hear the question? Did I ask Richard Mara for his advice? Right not. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, I have a question. A couple of them. One of them regarding the maze layout. How did you come up? Did, did someone give you the design nope. for the maze layout? Did that work? That's or mine. Yours? Okay. How did you come up with that? Or did someone come up with easily? Is the wing? Is on the 2600 at, with using a minimum amount of memory? <laughs> yeah. Um, there were a couple of things. Um, there are those who have worked on tighter schedules. Uh, one of the things that's important to me is that um, 4K was the most ROM available at that time. The 8K ROMs were not an option in 1981 until around November. Um, additional RAM was never an option. Um, it was a tight space. So when you come up to something like Pac-Man, again, um, if you can get something that's maze-like, and this is actually more than maze-like, it's actually sort of a maze, I guess that's maze-like, but um, it's a little box in the middle, a little box in the middle, that's expensive. <laughs> if I could have gotten away without a little box in the middle, I don't even know why I need a little box in the middle. I mean, I tried. Um, that costs tens of bytes of um, cost days of coding just to put a stupid little box in the middle of the screen. Maybe only not days, like two days. Because other than that, it's just straight repetition. And then you have to go, oh, but if I'm on row, then I have to do this differently. And it's, it's a tight little box. It's a very tight little box. Uh, what about the like the scoring? Like, for example, in the arcade version, the things were Dots were worth 10 points, you know, dose were, you know, 100, 200, where there's, in this version, the zero can drop. So there's a thing that I say. Um, in the early 60s, my father had a pizza shop on Ocean Avenue in San Francisco. And four storefronts down was this little pharmacy and, um, like, um, candy shop. And they had these comic books. They had these abridged great world literature comic books. Kid you not, these were comic books about this big. And there was a Treasure Island comic book. There, was, there wasn't a War and Peace comic book. But they had these abridged versions of these great pieces of literature, thousands of pages worth of literature that people wrote out longhand to write the manuscripts in the 1800s. I mean, oh my fucking God. As a little comic book. And that is what I felt I was doing, as I was abridging. Pac-Man. It is an abridged version. So, again, Howard could be right. It could be a waste of time trying to defend Pac-Man. <laughs> but, um, I just didn't know it was important. I also didn't know how much scrutiny it would get. And it's like, I thought, I thought, that if I didn't like Pac-Man, as much like Pac-Man as was easy, not easy. As I could, people would love me, but they didn't. Um, actually, they didn't. It was great. Um, so it didn't matter to me. It was, we didn't know. I mean, really, literally, honestly, it is practically impossible to understand how ignorant I was when I was 25. Yes, sir? I'm just wondering, something that's interesting about this is there's a lot of dots on the screen. There are a lot of dots on the screen. With the limited memory you have, how do you keep track of each dot's a bit. I forget how many dots there are, but... So, yeah, I mean, duh. It's actually quite stressful in terms of what taking over the app on that. So there's an interesting thing in my defense. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> um, one of the things that I did not think was optional was making it a two-player game. I mean, the way this does play is that I actually keep all of the dots. So a two-player game, Pac-Man. Arcade Pac-Man, you're playing, you reach a certain point in the maze and you die. When you come back, all of the dots are in the same place they were when you died. And that means that while the other player is playing, I have to keep the dots for both players. So I actually keep all of the dots for both players all of the time. It totals out to around almost 40% of the RAM. 
to keep the dots and the score and the life count for both players. But one thing, I, well, okay, so I think, I thought, I felt ignorant. Well, with whatever, whoever I was, it was a long time ago, I forgot who I was. Um, I didn't consider the notion that it was a two-player game, you picked up where you start up, where you left off, to be optional at all. I never questioned whether it should be a two-player game or a one-player game. And in my defense, <coughs> Edward could be right. Um, I, I won't say that again for a little while, probably. Um, um, there are several other adaptations of Pac-Man-like games, came subsequently, which have much better graphics and less flicker, but they don't have two-player support. It never, I, I, for me, the two-player support to people sitting next to each other on the couch in their living room, playing their Pac-Man with that back and forth, win and lose, competition and collaboration kind of, oh, two-player play was absolutely essential. And the black background, blue maze, was not. Um, and no one knew. And it made, yeah, I won't even go down that path. So yes, actually, every dot is a bit. I forget how many bits there are. I could go through and count it up. But it was very stressful, actually, storing every dot. Because it's a lot of bits. We got a thousand bits total. And when I call it, you know, 128 bytes, I call it a kilo bit. Yes, sir? Um, I'm the creative director at a video game museum in Oakland. And not a weekend goes by where somebody does not put in that in play. So I think the attraction that it offers as far as people having the memory of it plays or coming as a packing game, people still appreciate it for what it was at the time. And while it wasn't perfect in your eyes, people still like to do it. So it's interesting. But I haven't given up on defending. Because <laughs> you can't be a person who finishes 4K ROMs with two players worth of dots if you're a person who gives up easily. <laughs> yes. So just a quick comment on Pac-Man with the, the, the high profile thing, but there were other games that came out that also were not it's entirely true the arcade game. Asteroids on the 2600 isn't the same, and certainly Defender is not. I'll tell you, combat was probably the same on the 2600 as it was on the coin up. <laughs> it was a very brief period. <laughs> um, I have a little bit of 6502 source code I wrote for that I'd like to share with you if anyone is remotely interested. Show of hands, a little bit of, okay. Oh, Jesus, I hope I didn't oversell that. <laughs> so, here we are, there's Pac-Man. Here's 8-Bit Workshop with the 40% duty cycle. This would have been revolutionary. Um, and that's it with the very unfair uh, player all the time, ghosts only getting 25%. And the way this code looks is like that. Oh dear, talk about gibberish. Yes, I did oversell this. Um, so, let's see what I got here. So to do a 50% day of duty cycle, I have a multiplex counter. I have a Y red, you know. I have a Christ routine. Character horizontal Risa, which I call H Boz. And this is just. Dude, this is gibberish. I'm going to give up really quickly. Um, <laughs> this is. Stock 2600 code. It was like boilerplate code. We all got it along with the six K kernel, uh, the six character kernel. I'm um, up above is a little snippet I'll get to in a moment. So that just straight up horizontally positions a single character. So basically, we go along here. This already has more comments than my shipping code did. <laughs> um, so the challenge here is I load, load Y with the memory counter, with the multiplex counter, and I choose 
that's where it's going to run from zero to four. And I choose this character, this one of the five objects. The position is equal to the fact that one is the Pac-Man and the other four are ghosts. It doesn't matter for this. I'm just horizontally position them. And I horizontally position it. And I move on to the next one. And if the next one is past four, then I want to start over. So I'm just going to be counting 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And what's going to end up happening is that the duty cycle is going to look like Come on. This also some. I'm running on a Chromebook. Oh my God, things have come so far. So it's going to end up looking like this: player A B. Go away. It's going to be player zero one. God, come on. God's sakes. Um, it's going to be player zero and one. Not O and one. Zero and one then two and three, and then I need to go four and zero, and then one and two, and then three and four. And in those five frames, every player gets on twice. Much more equitable. And it's allowed the rinse repeat from here on out. These are incredibly simple cycles, right? Um, so, here at the five, we go, you're past four, you should go back to zero. We do that anywhere. Then you get, not this, and you get that. However, this is incredibly inefficient code. This is where it gets fun. Um, better, what's better about this? I forget. Oh, it's better, for instance, here. This is saying, use player zero for whatever object is up under the read head of the multiplex counter. And when you're just lazy, you just like do a load x immediate one. But I happen to know the subroutine call, the subroutine I call doesn't touch x or y. So actually, better would be I can save a byte by just using an i and x there. Saves a byte. But even better is you should never count up when you can count down. You never count up when you can count down. Yes, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. all right, so actually, and the reason for that is, is that instead of doing the compare Y, in fact, you don't have to do any comparison, because if you're decrementing, you can just check the um, sign bit to see if you've dropped beneath zero. This only works if you're in a range less than 128, but I'm counting between zero and five, for God's sakes, so that is less than 128. Um, so I can decrement and just do the branch on plus, saying, oh, we're still in range. And then doing the load y immediate four. So you always count down, unless you can't. Much better to count down. So that saves, that saves another four bytes right there, actually. Um, because I'm not needing to do the compare y's anymore. Um, so that's about as good as that gets. But even be 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 better, why is this better? Yes, even better, decrement y. But just about best, if I can get my browser to agree with me that it wants to let me show you this, even better is to take the code in just about best. Because here the decrement Y branch load four occurs twice, once for player zero and once for player one, because I have to check at the beginning and I have to check in the middle. Even better is to take that snippet of code and prepend it to just in front of the Christ routine. Let's see why my browser will not die. Uh, reviled like Pac-Man. Even better is to take those one, two, three, four, five, six, five bytes and prepend them to the subroutine. In which case I have just extracted another five bytes. So then you get into just about best. Um, which is actually only 12 bytes with an additional five bytes prepended to the subroutine. So I got it down to 17 bytes of ROM and one byte of RAM. And I could have had, boy, do I wish I had, or I don't know, but I do wish I had. And I could have had the 40% duty cycle flicker instead of the 
much reviled Pat Netflix. For me, what is just a little depressing is that the much reviled Pac-Man flicker actually costs 19 bytes of ROM instead of 17. <laughs> now, in fact, the multiplex counter is 3 bits, and if I don't dedicate a whole byte of RAM to it, I'm going to have to dedicate on the order of 10 bytes of ROM to packing and unpacking it in with some other 5 bits. So I might have been at 27 bytes of ROM and 3 bits of RAM, or at 17 bytes of ROM and a byte of RAM. I honestly don't know. I do not remember every byte of the freaking Pac-Man code. <laughs> I do have a disassembled copy of it, and who knows what I'll have next year. But that's actually what it looks like, going from this, which is the straight, just written 6502 code of a lot of bytes to now I am not positive that just about best is the best possible yet but I ran out of time um, so that's what coding for the Atari 2600 is like and it's a good time I get to just that so now back to that and that this to that Questions, comments, critiques? I am very used to criticisms. <laughs> uh, over here. I have to oh, yes, sir. Shrinking the code like that, with a, I'm assuming that would also save you some cycles on the CPU as well? Yes, in this particular case, I'm in overscan or underscan, and um, I do not remember being time constrained, horribly time constrained. Um, Pac Man was not an intense. Don't worry. Yeah, that wasn't. That was computation, um, but I'm not worried about it yet. <laughs> Actually, shrinking the code like that probably saves some cycles. Yes, it certainly saves cycles. Um, I don't think that was a constraint I was working towards in this case. Um, any others before? Yes, sir. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the schedule You know. Um, the normal schedule constraint was we were expected to produce a title in about six months. Uh, I was assigned to Pac-Man in something like February of 81, March of 81. I was, you know, final ROM by September. It was like uh, pretty much a lot of work. Um, but Pac-Man, unlike our friend E.T., which was psychotic. I mean, oh my fucking God, psychotic. <laughs> it's like, dude. Frogs. Um, it was like five months. It was like normal. I, I wasted a month with uh, maybe like six weeks trying things that couldn't be done. Um, and, and the truth with Pac-Man is I, I, I got overwhelmed by trying things that couldn't be done and then I just took the shortest path to good enough for a lot of things. Now the truth about Pac-Man, the shortest path to good enough is not a trivially short path when you're in a 4K ROM with 120 bytes of RAM. Um, but Oh well. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about the art? Because that was new? Did that impact your schedule? No. In fact, it was convenient. I mean, the, the art would have been worse if I'd done it. Because <laughs> 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 I would have taken the shortest path to good enough. We actually had an artist who spent, you know, several days, you know, thinking about mm, what would look good. Then that was good. Yes, sir? I don't remember any testing at all. <laughs> Let me rephrase that. I personally was not paying attention. There was no focus testing. I don't remember any testing. It spent a little while. I assume it spent a little while in QA. There is one known bug in Pac-Man. There is one known bug in Pac-Man, which I think is a pretty cool bug, actually. Tunnel glitch? What? <laughs> the tunnel glitch. There is one known bug in Pac-Man which is the tunnel glitch, which has to do with when the ghosts are going up and down the tunnel, once in a while a ghost will get stuck, and it'll just start going up and down and up and down. And if you're patient enough, all four ghosts will get stuck in the tunnel. And then you grab yourself a power pill, 
and go gobble all four ghosts immediately. So this is the only bug I know about, and it can actually, I mean, talk about luck, oh my god. Um, it can actually be seen as a kind of a cool feature. You have to be very patient. There's another one where I used to do it when we played, where you get, go it, you put pac in the tunnel, and there's some way you can move the joystick up and down while he's in the tunnel, and he'll come out the top, and kind of get stuck above, and then you go right down the middle. Yeah, I haven't seen that. I guess there's a second no bug in Pac-Man. It's like, that's a bug found every 13 years? Every, every 17 years, someone finds a bug in Pac-Man. So come back in a thousand years, and the thing won't even boot. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'll defend Pac-Man for you. Um, as a kid, I really liked, preferred uh, your maze design over the arcade. Ah. I preferred your colors over the arcade because it was much more colorful. Um, everything about that to me uh, was was better than the arcade. And I never heard any of my friends in school criticized Pac-Man back then. Uh, my cousins played it hours and hours on end. They had a system where they would be able to play it uh, nonstop with a certain pattern and everything. They loved it. Uh, so, and, and the ghosts also. Uh, to me, ghosts uh, should have been transparent, and so I liked the uh, transparent ghosts with the flicker. Um, there was somebody doing a homebrew a few years ago, and they did have Pac-Man flicker. And, and as well as the ghost flicker, and I argued on the forums then that you know, should be solid, ghosts should be transparent. You know? Well, obviously, you didn't work for a gaming magazine back in the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you know, maybe I'll stop defending Pac-Man someday. Who knows? Life is, <laughs> it's like you never know what's around the corner. Um, maybe this. Um, yeah, thanks. Maybe I'll stop defending Pac-Man someday. But what would I do? <laughs> uh, any other questions? Do you, do you have the uh, new version with your different flicker to see what it looks like? I don't. I haven't integrated that into Pac into the actual ROM yet. That is a buttload of work. Come back next year. <laughs> Every year. Every year, whether you know, just like a bath, once a year, whether I need it or not. <laughs> um, Any other questions, comments, critiques? I am very used to criticisms. Yes, sir. Uh, the design for the um, you know the, the treat in the middle of the the screen that uh, uh, the power pill is, uh, is that an original design contribution of yours? Uh, because obviously it doesn't look like bananas or cherries. You know, this is another example of what I was talking about. It's like I thought it was a part of Pac-Man was having some sort of biscuit. Um, which in other, which if you had, okay, yes, I am not done with defending Pac-Man. <laughs> so a Pac-Man arcade card game, you know, had like a two or three hundred dollars worth of 1980 electronics on it. Call it 400. And the Atari 2600 basically had about 20 dollars worth of circa 1976 electronics on it. Right now, Moore's Law had cranked around twice between 76 and 80, so that's a four times multiplier. And uh, actually, it was double the speed and half the price, right? So that's actually 16 times the, like, the um, computing power on that board per dollar. So it's about 10 to 20 times the, the number of dollars. That's like, Someone do the math, it's somewhere like around a thousand times more computing power on a Pac-Man board than there is an Atari 2600. So no, I was not obsessed with having it look like a piece of fruit. <laughs> because I was running on a very tight budget by comparison to what they actually have in the hardware. And this is the real deal. I mean, one of the really interesting things is we did fucking amazing stuff with the 2600. We took it so far beyond what it should ever have been. Thank you. And uh, the coin-op guys didn't like lock down their hardware at 1974 <laughs> with diodes, with the graphics like laid out on the boards with diodes, you know. Um, talk to Ed about that. 
They just kept on marching. So we were falling further and further behind. And it was just pure brain power and the larger ROMs and chutzpah, actually, that had us anywhere in the ballpark with what you were seeing in the arcades. I mean, basically, this is fucking impossible. Can't even be done. Well, oh well, apparently it can. Um, so I could do something. I needed to do something. I, I have a player, I have a ball and a missile. It doesn't look anything like a cherry. Just a ball and a missile. But it does the same thing, except maybe its score is only a tenth of what it is on the arcade version. It is actually really interesting. I'm really happy, actually, to have been at Atari back then. I'm really happy to have survived for long enough to have some idea of how ignorant I was then and to understand that that ignorance was actually shared by pretty much everyone on the planet. No one knew. I mean, we were making something completely new. And there's a way of thinking about this stuff now. I was talking with some guy who had the really interesting to me perspective that actually um, video game journalism was even more primitive than video games in the early 80s. So it's like, we were just all finding our way through this complete fog of ignorance with a few bytes of ROM and a few bytes of RAM and these keyboards. We didn't even have mouses, remember that? It's like, we didn't even have mouses, just keyboards and CRTs. It's good times. Is there anyone who hasn't asked a question yet before I get to someone who's asking their second question? Yes, sir, back there. Yes, you talk about yourself being ignorant. How about the management at Atari? Management was like even more, well, actually, oh, yeah, well, come back next year. Um, <laughs> everyone, uh, yeah, it's, uh, we were working for a guy who knew how to sell bed sheets and towels, except he didn't know how to sell them well enough to keep that job. So, yeah, okay, one more. Yes. Um, what would it take for you to uh, infiltrate Facebook and take them down? <laughs> <laughs> mm, I'd have to buy a few congressmen. <laughs> yes, sir. You had your hand up. Uh, uh, how did you guys get assigned your projects? Was it randomly or did you? Um, in this particular case, um, Pac Man and Defender became available with them at the same time, and I was had just finished a job, and another program had just finished a job. So management said, we have two tiles, we got two programmers, you guys do it. And um, the other programmer said, I don't see how to do Pac-Man, so I'll do Defender. And I said, okay, great, I'll do Pac-Man. It was just like that. It was very casual. So it's actually amazing how casually a billion dollar business was run. No one knew anything. I mean, really, it is amazing. And I talk about myself being ignorant, and I don't mean that in a pejorative sense. I actually mean that there was information about the world that I did not have. That's ignorance. I think I'm out of time. Thank you all. <laughs>